Welcome to the Cinderella podcast, where we watch and review every Cinderella adaptation we can get our hands on, discussing the same story over and over until we slowly go insane. I'm Liv. And I'm Talon. And today we watched, I'm going to butcher this, but I'm trying my best, Der Wellerenschof, it's German, made it's... in 1923. And we're going to call it the Two Slippers Cinderella, which will become evident. Yeah. So, Der Wollerina Schuh is German for the lost shoe. I probably also butchered that, but I did so with much more confidence. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so German for the lost shoe rather than the little ash girl. So that was, that was fun. There is no IMDb trivia about this movie, which was unfortunate because I, I feel would like, love to have trivia on this oh, movie. I, I want to know so much about this movie. This movie was such a ride. This felt a lot like Cendrillon, the 1899 one mm -hmm. but it lasted 25 minutes instead of six minutes but somehow managed to be just as manic i don't know if i'm doing okay <laughs> <laughs> all right so talon do you want to start us out on how this roller coaster begins oh sure so we start weirdly enough with a black card with white text on it that part's not weird but it says once upon a time, there was a good and kind fairy godmother. And then we see an interior of a home and a woman who is the fairy godmother appears to be spinning thread, but you can't see anything that she's spinning. So she's just kind of waving her hands in the air. It looks like she's tracing invisible spider webs. I have, I have spinning spider webs in my notes. And Cinderella arrives and she's labeled. She's yes, a there's label. a sign that says Cinderella right when she walks in like it's a sitcom. It's great. I really appreciated it. Yeah, I, I wish more characters were labeled. That was helpful. I wish they had continued labeling them because I had a hard time recognizing people in really washed out black and white. Yeah, movies from the long ago times are hard to distinguish faces because the film quality is poor and has degraded which is unfortunate because i would have loved to see some of the facial expressions these folks were making because oh it was it was intense <laughs> so cinderella kind of gestures at the fairy godmother and the fairy godmother explains that she's weaving the golden threads of cinderella's future and then she comes over to cinderella and hands her a pair of glasses and you see this giant spider web appear in the corner of the room and it's huge and it's just basically a spider web and presumably it's gold it's very sparkly it it reads as sparkly we should probably describe these people because we're going to be spending a lot of time with the fairy godmother so the fairy godmother is wearing uh, 1780s just sort of peasant clothes just tight bodice dark dress floofy sleeves uh hair and sort of a low bun with a flat cap cinderella is wearing a slightly prettier dress it's got floofier sleeves she's very blonde she has big sausage curls she looks a lot like the disney the animated disney cinderella yeah she does have a very similar look to her the fairy godmother has a very expressive face and it's a very strange face i'm not at all convinced that this character was not actually acted by a man at various times she will look kindly or like a goblin or like the wicked witch from Snow White. And the background music makes it very unclear which one of those portrayals we're supposed to be taking away from this. She has a lot of gestures that are weirdly creepy, that are very. supposed to be magical, but come off as just, I'm gonna get you. Yeah, just hunched over, sort of long arms and lots of elbow movement in a very, come here, my child, kind of way. And everything she does is benevolent. Most of what she does is benevolent. There's, there's a bridge incident, but mostly she seems benevolent. But it's just a weird undercurrent of like, is she evil? She feels evil. Yeah, and the background music is uh, contributing to that illusion. So now the fairy godmother who has given Cinderella her magic glasses says, I want to show you my magic mirror. And Cinderella looks very taken aback. She looks very puzzled by this statement. The fairy godmother walks to a, a counter mirror with Rococo frills on it, 
and pulls off the sheet that was covering it and we see her reflection in the mirror and i swear to god it's a jump scare it is it was so sudden it was I literally made a sound she looks like a goblin from labyrinth the reflection of her in the mirror has large clay-like eyes and sort of weird slabs of face and just deeply it just looks like a clay puppet i hated and she's it she's hunched over again again yeah she's hunched down but the way the mirror is you're seeing a reflection of her from beneath and so it's it's very jarring it's 100 percent a pop scare i literally thought that there was a little goblin in the mirror that was yeah. gonna tell her things me too. and it took me a moment to be like no that's just her and you're being like very mean I don't even know that we're being mean. I don't think you can film a pop scare like that unintentionally. I think you have to know what you're doing. Okay. The mirror now imparts some information. Well, the fairy godmother says, let me show you what will soon happen. Yep. And she looks into the mirror and announces, your father is going to marry a cruel woman with two daughters. And we're looking in the mirror, seeing two dark-haired young ladies about Cinderella's age arguing with one another and playing tug of war over a basket of clothes and a fat kind of sour looking older woman with a again a little cap like they used to wear when you got married in another part of the room just sort of looking smug she tells her daughters something we don't know what and the girls stop fighting over the clothes in this basket in this mirror and sort of happily skip towards their mother and Cinderella looks down at her hands very sadly not like she looks down sadly she holds her hands up to her face and looks at them very sorrowfully i wish there had been a title card for what was said in that scene because i it was i was confused i want to know what cinderella is supposed to do with this information right because she's literally interrupted in this moment this mirror excursion that we're all forced to go on is interrupted by more surprise trumpets and she runs out of what is presumably her home to a carriage arriving home and this new wife that we've just seen walks up to her and she's carrying bunches of bouquets of flowers presumably because they literally just got married mm -hmm. and my note says and now we're in the 1600s because a bunch of guys dressed like pilgrims fancy pilgrims parade out of this carriage carrying lots of packages so many people come out of the carriage it's but not surprising. In, but not in a funny way, not in a comedic way, just there just keep being more people. So we get through a title card narration that the father is too scared of the stepmother to stand up to her on Cinderella's behalf, at which point the two of us realized that there would be an alive father through the entirety of the Cinderella, and we both made disappointed sounds. Yeah. I <sighs> just... What? You just married her. You're... How is he already afraid of her? I don't know. This only makes sense if she's blackmailing him into marriage. If she's got blackmail or she's, she knows where his aging mother lives and is threatening to murder her unless he marries her. That's, nothing else makes sense. They've only spent the carriage ride together. Do you think she faked it up until they got married and literally the second they were married, like in the carriage? she just unleashed the full force of her terrible personality on him like what happens when you clock off after a terrible customer service shift and someone asks you how your day was yes exactly just unleashed vitriol yeah that must have been we'll talk about it more in the after party we're going to spin <laughs> some some scenarios so they file into this house which by the way looks very much like some of the set from the slipper and the rose i was i was taken aback and the father is carrying a comical number of massive packages. Cinderella says, I'm giving my dinner to the poor. And the stepmother, who has been climbing the stairs, throws a hissy fit and storms back down the stairs and comes into the kitchen. And Cinderella has been feeding homeless vagabonds. They're just around her table. We know they're homeless because they're smudgy. Smudgy means homeless. And the stepmother does not say anything. She just walks up to the table and glares at them. And these three big dudes just stand up and shamefacedly shuffle out of the kitchen. And then she picks up the tureen of soup that was on the table and throws it at Cinderella's feet. 
And then Cinderella sits sadly in the fireplace with a live fire, but doesn't catch on fire. No. Is that what happened? Did I miss anything? The stepmother announces there will be no beggars in my house, but that's Uh, about it. Yeah. That doesn't go anywhere. That's not a plot point that really hinges on anything. Yeah, they never come back. Like, well, this isn't I mean, something they... Cinderella fights over. So, I think maybe they're the ghosts that come back later in the end. Maybe oh, because she. So? They. It looked like the same three guys. They were wearing the same clothes and they had the same sort of baggy hair. I'm not willing to watch it again, but <laughs> I think that because Cinderella wasn't allowed to feed them, they all starved to death in the two days that this movie takes place in. That's so bleak. I really don't like this. (laughs) I don't like this either. I mean, I love it, but it's 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 German from the twenties, man. What do you want from me? I guess this is right after World War One. Like this is this is a dark time in history. So that makes sense. We then get the title card that says, "King Kindheart lives in a nearby palace," and I lost my mind. I had to pause the movie and just look at the word King Kind Heart for a while. It was an incredible moment. It was. In the sense that I, I don't find it credible. Like, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't do anything kind, by the way. He's not like at any point sweet to Cinderella or his son or anyone. Nope. But he is indeed um, memorable. Do you want to talk about how we meet our lovely King Kind Heart? Colin? Oh yeah, uh, this guy's in a pool. He's just bathing and he comes out of the pool and some attendants wrap a towel around him and then he sits in a fancy chair wrapped in a towel by the pool and proclaims, we must give a ball for the prince. It's time he's married. The king looks like the Three Stooges prince, by the way. Like he's very skinny and has very weird messed up hair. But he doesn't look happy. He looks kind of gloomy. He makes this proclamation to like the servants and presumably like his attendants or Mm -hmm. other people in the government, maybe? They just all are standing there while he's sitting in his towel. And he's not like wrapped around his waist. He's wearing it like a blanket. He is. Initially, he wears it like a toga, like over one shoulder and then thrown over that same shoulder. But then he's just wearing it like a blankie. And again, he just looks like a sad one of the Three Stooges. I was really happy that he wasn't naked, because initially we only see him from the waist up, and he is naked. And I was like, oh god, please don't be naked. Well, we don't see how big the body of water is at first. And I had my fingers crossed, and I was like, please be a pool and not a bathtub. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) The levels to which we lower our standards. Please don't be a bathtub. Please don't be a bathtub. So then we get a title card saying Prince Charming was lonely and sad. And that's his name mm-hmm. is Charming. And yep. we see him sitting on a chair with his head bowed and he's playing a cello, presumably very sadly. Yes, presumably very sadly. He's got dark hair and he looks nice. He's a man-shaped man. I don't know. Yeah. It was very blurry. He's tall and kind of slender. Eh. I had a hard time keeping track of him because there are a surprising amount of people in this movie. Not a lot of named characters, but there's just a massive cast for this. And I kept losing track of which one he was because they don't put him in distinctive clothing. He's not wearing the fanciest hat or the tightest breeches or anything or the darkest clothes. He's just dressed like everybody else and it's black and white. So it's not even color coded for us. Yeah, and there's a lot. There's servants that run around and do stuff. Unless also, that was him. he wears a wig during, like, fancy oh. moments. Oh, yeah. And that's really hard, because he goes from having dark hair to having white hair, because it's one of those, like, old-timey fancy man wigs. But that's literally his only defining feature, is this is the dark-haired one, and when that goes away, it's really hard to tell him from the servants. Unless he's literally interacting with Cinderella, I could not tell which one he was. Yeah, anytime he was in the crowd, I was, like, literally could be anyone and anytime they showed a man alone I was like I guess that's the prince I guess so we now get the scene of the invitation to the ball being read just a massive truckload of people traipse into this open courtyard the stepsisters and the stepmother are on a balcony listening very excitedly Cinderella has opened the front door 
directly below the balcony and is sort of listening excitedly crouched in the corner of the door. They show us the announcement, but it's the calibration of light and dark is a little off. So it just looks like a white sheet of paper. You can't read anything on it. But even yep. if you could, presumably it would be in German. Oh, wow. It would be in German. So we still wouldn't know what it says. Wait, well, then why weren't the title cards in German? Because they translated them. But it looks so old timey. Did they? I don't know. Right? They. When did they translate this? I don't know, because it looked like they made it in the long ago time. I mean, it's from 1923, but... Do you think countries shared movies like that? Maybe. And I mean, it was a time where you could just sort of literally cut and paste film. You could just cut and paste. But they had they had people labeled in, in scenes that were oh. moving. Yes. So they must have filmed it in English? But I guess. why is the title in German? I don't know. <sighs> They could have painted over by hand. They could have. Sure. Why not? I don't... We can't fall down this rabbit hole. There are I'm too so many sorry. other... I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. There are so many other rabbit holes, Talon. We cannot get stuck in this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the massive entourage of people leave, and Cinderella sneaks up the staircase to the room that her stepmother and her father are in, her still very much alive father. And she's, she, um, she's carrying a bowl of something in her hands. That's important for later. Yes. So she sort of sneaks into the room and then beckons with one finger very creepily to her father, who slinks past the stepmother like there should be Pink Panther music playing in the background. There's not, unfortunately. I think that would have really improved this scene. And Cinderella whispers to him and... The stepmother looks at them sharply and they both look terrified. The father looks like he is in mortal peril, which to be fair, he probably is. Yeah, I was going to say, that seems kind of like the right reaction. Yeah, I I did at least believe that this father was terrified of his wife, which is better than just oblivious, I suppose. I don't think it's better. (laughs) We'll discuss this in the after party. Okay. And says, Cinderella would like to go to the ball. And the stepmother laughs. And again, beckons very aggressively to Cinderella. This is not a good beckon. I would not come to this beckon. This is a bad things happen after this. It's very obvious. And the stepmother sort of puts her arm Cinderella and pets her hair very creepily. Mm -hmm. And then takes the bowl away. And we haven't seen what's in this bowl. So I'm expecting it to be a bowl full of gross stuff that she throws on Cinderella. But it's not. Oh, I thought it was like a bowl of water so they could wash their faces or something. Yeah, I thought it was going to be a bowl of liquid because it's a bowl and that she was going to make Cinderella gross or something. But it's not. She pours it into a bucket and says, you can go when you've separated the, these beans from cinders. Why was Cinderella carrying a bowl of beans into the room? Because? <laughs> I don't know. I have okay. no answers for you. Because she wasn't holding that bowl of beans when she was listening to the proclamation, which means that she listened to the proclamation, went inside, went into the kitchen, got a bowl of beans, and then climbed up the staircase to ask if she could go to the ball. Oh my god. (laughs) That's the only thing that makes sense. I know, but I... Okay. Guys, there's so many rabbit holes in this movie. We could be here for hours. Okay, so Cinderella takes the bucket with the ashes and the beans outside and starts separating them out while the stepmother and the stepsisters laugh from the window a lot. Mm -hmm. And then we see another title card, and it says, the fairy godmother soon sent help to her goddaughter. And we see a shot of a lot of birds flying towards the camera. It is so many birds. It is not the amount that Cinderella usually gets. It's an entire flock. It's a a thriving flock of will look like homing pigeons, but are probably supposed to be doves. Yeah, presumably they're doves. So they come and there's some doves near her, and I guess they help. And then they reverse the footage of the birds flying towards the camera. So it looks like they're flying away, and I guess they're done. It was very creative, I want to say. The birds look like they are attacking Cinderella because this is filmed in sort of double speed at this point. Or at least it looks like it to me. It looks like she's being attacked by birds. At one point, a bird lands on her hair. I would have screamed (laughs) and just fled the movie. Just like, I quit. 
I quit. I'm done. These do not appear to be trained birds. They're not doing anything. They're just in proximity to Cinderella. Yeah, all, you know, 75 of them. So then we see a carriage. And the stepmother and the stepsisters are already in the carriage. And so is the father. Oh, he sure is. Yep. He's just, he's there. So Cinderella runs up to the carriage. And she's done. She shows the bowl. And the stepmother tells her, now you can draw water from the well and wash yourself and cackles and the carriage just drives away we clearly see the father in this carriage just no facial reaction just okay i guess that's the thing that happened in my presence mm. i hate him i hate, hate him, him. Yeah. so mad i will be madder about other things but i was also real mad in this moment so, so this is where the beggar ghosts show up yeah there's three men I think, that appear, and they're kind of wearing rags, and they're see-through. They're doing a layering kind of thing with the film. Mm -hmm. I think it might be called double exposure. I'm not sure. And they're Uh, floating, so presumably they're ghosts. Yeah, also see-through. Like, very obviously see-through. So these are definitely ghosts. Okay. They may or may not be the beggars from before. I think they're the beggars from before. I'm so sorry to make it so dark. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> they inform Cinderella, um, go and pray at your mother's grave. You'll have a surprise. And then there's an exclamation mark. Yup. By the way, the background music at this time is very dramatic classical music. This is the classical music that you play when the storm is at its height and the ship is about to go down. This is the classical music you play when the killer is about to stab somebody. This is key high drama classical music. Well, I think it's meant to symbolize how Cinderella is feeling. She's feeling very upset. And this is her lowest moment. And that's fine. I'm just going to make a note that we get this music several other times throughout the film. This is the, I guess, most appropriate usage. Okay. (laughs) So Cinderella goes over to a bucket that's near a well I guess and washes herself and pulls out a key from the bucket from the bucket from the bottom of the bucket that can't be okay I, I don't know why is she keeping a key because like, that's we're, not that's <sighs> not good for the water and that's not good for the key yeah also at this point we've been given no indication that anything whatsoever is locked so from our viewing experience we're not really even sure this is a key because she holds it up and it's big, but again, the, the film quality is such that not clear that it's a key. So she runs to the locked gate of the graveyard. The graveyard is locked. and Maybe the stepmother doesn't want her going in there? I guess. The fairy godmother is in a different room, just sort of a tower balcony room, just doing wild dramatic motions. I just have stuff quintuple exclamation marks she's just moving dramatically she's just doing fairy godmother things i took very bad notes on the scene and my notes say meanwhile fairy godmother and then nothing (laughs) (laughs) oh my god that's that's not really better than mine so the fairy godmother is doing a lot of things at this moment but cinderella kneels at her mother's grave and a ghost shows up to offer her a flower. And now that I'm saying it out loud with my mouth, I think that was a ghost of the prince. I think that was a future ghost. I think so, because he's kneeling, mirroring her body language. And yeah. he's exactly on the other side of her. And I think it was meant to symbolize what he was doing at the time, but in the palace to show that they were connected in some way. But it looks like there's a ghost of the prince, like he died and there's a ghost of him in the graveyard. I did not get that until just the second. I was just like, why is there a ghost of some random dude offering her a flower? Because later in the ball, the prince will be told to offer a flower to the most beautiful woman. That scene hasn't happened yet. So this is a call forward to something that no one has seen. And as such is really weird. It's not even foreshadowing. Because we don't, I mean, is it foreshadowing? It doesn't seem like foreshadowing. If it's foreshadowing, they did it wrong. I can't even begin to imagine what they thought they were accomplishing with it. Yeah. Maybe so, they just really liked that effect and just wanted to use it again. Use it somewhere. Yeah. The fairy godmother is now dramatically playing a piano and yeah. 
it very much feels like she is the one making this background music, which is still high drama classical music. So I think the fairy godmother is actually just playing the background music live, like Miguel and Tulio, just <laughs> doing the background music in real time. And then she, the fairy godmother goes out on her balcony and takes a huge gulp of air and blows dramatically at a tree which starts shaking and then lots of they're clearly supposed to be petals we figure out later uh just attack cinderella yeah I, the branches kind of get low enough to maybe hit her mm-hmm. and she looks distressed her arms are up and she's kind of walking through it and she doesn't look like she's having a good time. Yeah, her her hands are sort of covering her face. She's doing very sort of traditional damsel in distress motions and gestures and things. But it turns out that these petals form a gown, which is a pretty gown. It looks very 1780s. Shiny. It and it looks actually, very nice. Yeah, I really like that transition. I thought that was a really, really cool transition. When the flowers turned into a gown and the modern one the Camille Cabello one oh, I didn't yeah. like that that was it was an interesting transformation but they didn't it felt weird I didn't like it this was really cool because it was clear that Cinderella didn't know what was happening and she was very alarmed and there's oh. just a beautiful dress yeah that's the part I don't like I feel like I would have really enjoyed this if Cinderella hadn't been terrified while it was happening because for all she knows she's just getting attacked by trees like trees are alive and they hate her is that the surprise that she was going to get from the ghost? You get to go to, go pray by your mother's grave. A tree will attack you. <laughs> <laughs> her point of view is like amazing. We're we're seeing all this largely. I mean, it's from a narrator point of view, but we get a lot of the fairy godmother's story. Mm-hmm. And, and I, yet, I really wish... nothing about her. Yeah, absolutely nothing but these weird, terrifying hints. I really want I really want to see Cinderella's experience of that moment from her eyes of, and then the ghosts of three beggar men appeared, and then I fished in a bucket and found a key to a locked door to a graveyard, and then a tree attacked me, and now I'm wearing a gold dress. <laughs> just, I would have a meltdown. I would and just sit down. you have to go to a party after all of that. And you have to go to a party. A, a beautiful white carriage with four white horses is showing up now. And now you have to go to a party and be sociable. Yeah, the carriage just pulls up. You see it through the gate of the wall that she went through. And it's just there. And then Mm -hmm. the fairy godmother appears. And she's wearing like a shawl over her head in a way that makes her look very creepy. She looks like a fur palpatine. Yeah, it's an evil witch style. That's how you wear your cloak if you are an ugly old witch and you're either asking for a shelter from the storm from a handsome cruel prince or about to give a lovely young girl a poisoned apple just one of those two things i literally wasn't sure if it was her because she looked so evil yes so cinderella gets told remember to leave the ball before 12 and she just gets into the carriage and the fairy godmother waves her off and we stay with the fairy godmother instead of following the carriage The dramatic classical music is still playing. The high drama ship in a storm, it has not stopped. I would also like to point out that Cinderella did not receive any shoes. If the shoes transform, then it wasn't mentioned. Or if she's wearing her own shoes, also not mentioned. Yep. Uh, The fairy godmother also gives her a very long-lasting creepy kiss on the forehead, which I didn't care for. (laughs) (sighs) So we cut to the ball now. and. We get the title card, the fairy godmother has been asked to play for the party, at which point we both had to stop the movie. Yeah, the fairy godmother did not ride in the carriage with Cinderella, which we've seen in a couple of Cinderella's, but she has appeared at the party Mm -hmm. ahead of Cinderella in order to play piano for (gasps) the guests. Do you think that's the piano that she was playing in the scene where she had to stop and go do weird hand stuff and blow a tree? Was she playing piano at the party where the prince was? I like, mean, did she do I guess, all or the... there's, otherwise there's two pianos in the Cinderella. Did she do all of the magic stuff from the palace? Like, she went to the palace, started playing piano for everybody, realized that she needed to do magic, did a bunch of magic stuff from the balcony, realized she needed to explain it, poofed herself over to Cinderella's mother's grave, and then poofed herself back to her piano in time to finish the set? Is that what happened? I, I guess... Or maybe, or maybe there's like a band or an orchestra or something 
and they just know that she plays well and like at a dinner party you have like a person play oh Maybe so it not was like that so not like to accompany the entire party not like as an orchestral solo play please provide all the background music for this party but just as hey would you sing a song for us or something that's like, how i interpreted it but it oh, also that makes, makes much more it, sense but it also implies that the king and queen know the fairy godmother oh yeah so we now get to watch the party and this is a nice party there's a decent amount of people at it and they're dancing a minuet simple it's classic it's pretty they're doing it well there are beautiful chandeliers in there the are palace. and everybody's wearing very pretty dresses that did not upset me in any way whatsoever so at this point somebody i don't know if this is the queen or the evil stepmother no this is somebody else no i okay. think the king and queen whisper to each other okay that would make sense okay we haven't seen a queen but presumably there is a queen and presumably this was her sure then somebody else tells a, a young girl a young woman yes. approaches the prince with a basket full of flowers and curtsy kneels very low before him and says will the prince please give the flower to the most beautiful lady in the room which is wild wild just out of nowhere and the girls all sort of curtsy and face him in a weird aggressive circle and the fairy godmother looks up very sneakily and the evil stepmother kind of shoves her daughters out first to the front of the circle and we then we get the title card but the prince cannot choose and he sort of looks sadly down at the flower <laughs> which like what a rude move i don't think that's rude i think that's the most polite thing you can do okay so because he doesn't offer anything to the room and he's just looking very sad how that read to me was ah oh, i wish you all weren't so ugly like oh. i can't even if he had been like oh there's so many different types of beauty i couldn't choose just one yes that is a politic way of getting out of that situation but because he doesn't say anything whatsoever and just looks sadly at this flower it's like oh i wish you weren't all such trolls <laughs> oh it's me i must be sad forever where's my cello just oh he could have given it to the queen right been like mother you're the most beautiful or found like a small child like a little girl and been just like you are the purest prettiest whatever happy five-year-old whatever that would have been fine unless it's like a betrothal and now he has to marry the five-year-old eventually yeah i don't think it is the the flower is not say, stated to be anything other than just which one of these girls do you find hottest so the prince cannot choose and he goes to stand by a window and just looks sadly out the window which i love because mm -hmm. he's at a ball yeah he's at his own party and he happens to see the carriage pull up and he's curious about it so he runs to meet it but he hides behind the door of the gate and just kind of presses himself to the wall and hopes nobody looks at him Cinderella gets out of the carriage and she looks beautiful and she walks right past him and the prince follows and then kind of runs to catch up to her and they stop in front of the stairs and you see him give her the flower and okay. we don't know if he's explained what this means okay yeah that that's what happens but the the body language in this is telling a very different story so when the prince sees the carriage he staggers back from the window with just abject terror on his face <laughs> and it was unclear that he was hiding behind a gate so what i have is he walks up to the open door and he seems to have fallen in love with her carriage because there's no way he could have seen her he finally does see her she walks directly past him he trails after her like a puppy catches her against a banister which she is back bent over again just with a look of extreme fear and terror in her eyes just i don't know who this person is why are you talking to me why have you stopped me on the staircase i don't like this stranger danger and then he he gives her the flower and she brightens a bit and takes his hand and they go up the stairs but he's leading her up the stairs with their arms at full length so he's not quite dragging her up the stairs the way you do with a recalcitrant toddler but only just and it but they're just holding hands it's fine the, the body language was so weird and strained though as someone who doesn't really read facial expression very well i i try to pay more attention to body language because i misread facial expressions all the time 
and the body language in this was just so weird it was very jarring we're still having dramatic classical music by the way this is still the ship is in a storm we don't know if we're gonna make it the killer is coming music <laughs> during the it's a dramatic the, moment is it the ship is going down dramatic though like there's different types of drama Talon. they had a limited um budget i guess i guess i was like blow up a grain silo so it couldn't have been that limited Shh, don't give it away <laughs> okay and then we get supper um supper has arrived that's that's no the not yet no, no not yet so they walk into the room and everyone parts and right. kind of clears the floor for them and they're either dancing very weirdly or they're just going in a big circle they're just going in a big circle he's just parading her around the room they're they are not dancing together i thought maybe it was a type of dance nope i like your hopes but no <laughs> so then she curtsies and then it's announced that the supper hour has arrived and i'm so excited that this ball has like dinner that's yeah, great snackies snackies are super important you get hungry when you're dancing you do it's a good exercise so we watch servants bring out a whole bunch of chairs and place them in a line as though there's a table but there's not a table servants just bring out chairs and uh, the rest of the party goers file out of the room except for the prince and cinderella someone and... is talking to the prince yeah um i just have it as a guy but it could be the king it could be a servant it could be anyone i have in my notes, the king, a servant, someone in my notes. So, yeah. yeah same page. And uh, Cinderella makes sort of a fainting motion with her hand, just sort of a back of the hand to the forehead. Oh, I, I feel faint. And then we get the most terrifying clock sounds I've ever heard in my life. We also get a reminder with the title card that says, and remember, leave the ball before 12. Which means that they're having supper at midnight? Question that, mark? That is accurate. The way a lot of balls used to go is that they were genuinely all night affairs. So you would arrive at, you know, eight or nine and there would be sort of light snackies arranged through the room and you would have dances and sort of light conversation and then you would have dinner and you would have the dinner waltz. And whoever you waltzed with for the dinner waltz got to lead you off the floor because women were not allowed to go anywhere unaccompanied. So you literally had to be walked out onto the dance floor and then returned to whoever uh, was in charge of you. Oh my um, God. But because what happens next is dinner, whoever you waltz with for the dinner waltz leads you in to dinner because that's the next place that you have to go, which means that they own you for the next dinner period, which is usually at like midnight. So you, then you get to sit and talk with this person. Hopefully this is someone you like. And then after dinner, sort of like the old people get to go to sleep in the chairs and like the young people get to have a little bit more fun and like the men who don't want to be there get to go off and like play cards and gamble and stuff but the thing goes until like three or four in the morning this is like an all-night affair there are like, so many things in that that i can't even begin to comment on it this is all just information i have in my head i feel like that was just a bunch of perfectly normal stuff that i said but now that i think back about what i just said i never i feel weird about myself now okay whatever it's fine <laughs> So we do get a brief uh, image of this clock face. It is 11.55, by the way. It's not midnight. And we don't get gong sounds. We don't get the, the clock striking midnight. We just get this horrifying tick, tock, tick, tock sound just that goes on forever. It goes it's on for so long. very anxiety inducing. Oh, yeah. Just didn't like it. Cinderella tries to flee, but the prince stops her. And Wait, she and the prince have like a moment. Oh, okay. Sure. So Cinderella leans against the prince's chest and then she kind of pulls back and they clasp hands and then she runs away. And during that clasping of hands, I think she leaves the flower with him because the next time we see him, he has the flower. So what I think happens is she tries to run. He sort of stops her and like grabs her hands and she sort of stops to flirt with him for a little bit. And then the rose falls and as the prince bends to pick it up, he has to let go of her and she runs away again. Oh, I missed and then that. We get the fairy godmother scratching her butt and the prince runs into a dude with a bunch of papers on top of a staircase. I thought that he was intercepted by a screaming lady. I, there's and definitely a thing where a bunch of papers 
go flying. He knocks, he runs into somebody who is carrying a bunch of papers, just a whole sheaf of papers that all go flying into the air. We see the fairy godmother doing stuff. I think she's scratching her butt. That's what it looks like to me. Cinderella's gown fades from this beautiful sparkly gold thing to the sort of high-waisted dark skirt and sort of loose country top that she's been wearing until now. So it's midnight. Yeah. And she is still in the palace. So she sort of hides in the shadows. Hides implies that she's in some way obscured from a direct line of sight. She just... She hides where the prince hid earlier. So she's just in the corner, kind of behind the door of the gate. But like, if you looked in that direction, you would just see her. She's just in the shadow. She's not, there's nothing, she's not hiding behind anything or under anything or sideways. To, there's nothing near her. She's just in the shadows, but not like dark shadows, just not a spotlight the way the prince is. And he walks right past her. Yeah, he doesn't notice her at all. And he, not, not even a look. Ugh. Yeah. And then he starts to eat the rose. Oh, it's a kiss, my notes script. Because he just puts the whole rose, it looks like, into his mouth. <laughs> he does not. He <laughs> brings it to his lips very sadly. He looks very sad. This is, the I think, the saddest prince we've ever had. We're still having high drama, this is terrifying classical music, guys, just for most of this. We get a shot of the ball again, and everyone going, where is the prince? And so a bunch of people run out. And they've got giant lamps of some kind. Mm -hmm. They're like spotlights. And I guess they're looking for Cinderella. I think at this point they're looking for him because he turns towards them. And as his back is turned, she leaves her not at all hidden hiding place and races out of the gate, at which point he tracks the, the movement and races after her, along with everybody else who I guess is now chasing her. And now she loses her shoe. Yes. And then we have the bridge scene. So in most Cinderella's, Cinderella has like a significant lead on the prince. And so he just kind of gives up at the stairs because he can't see her carriage. Mm -hmm. um, this guy is pretty close. and He's right behind her. He's yeah. just still chasing her. So in the next bit, they are, picture this bridge that has two parts that open in the middle and kind of raise up and down. And in the middle of the bridge is a tower with like a gazebo on top of it. This is supposed to be like a decorative bridge. Yeah. So uh, the fairy godmother, I guess the bridge is probably not meant to raise up that way it's now that not I think about it. It's not meant to raise up. It is, it is a decorative sort of spindly, very high arched bridge. So it's not like a flat bridge. It's very up and downy. And it has a gazebo in the middle. And as Cinderella crests the peak of this gazebo, the fairy godmother does stuff and turns it into essentially the staircases from Hogwarts. And the section of the bridge that Cinderella is on twists toward us and separates from the gazebo tower part. And the part of the bridge that the prince has just been on, the prince is in the gazebo now. So the entrance to this bridge also turns and the rest of the entourage is now stuck on that side of the river or something and then the fairy godmother throws cinderella a cloak cinderella wraps it around herself and is invisible and the prince is just stranded in a gazebo tower in the middle of a river with a broken bridge how are they gonna get him out is the fairy know. godmother gonna fix the bridge at some point i don't bridges are hard bridges are hard and that was a fancy bridge it was all roundy it wasn't just like oh knock over a tree that was a someone did a crafting to make that tower I don't know how to get him out. Do you think that bridge was just over like a wide babbling creek that people didn't want to cross? Or do you think it was over like a cliff? Oh, like a, no, I like, think it's just a creek. I think like a chasm. I think the prince had to be stranded in the gazebo so that he didn't just like run over it. All right, fine. I guess I will take the happy interpretation. So from that scene, we go back to the fairy godmother and she is returning to her mirror and we see the prince lying sadly on a fainting sofa, holding the shoe in his hand. It looks like he's in an opium den, just to be clear. His position and expression are uh, sad Byron. <laughs> we get a title card that says Prince Charming was lovesick, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of people lined up outside his door, and they're all whispering to each other. And what they're whispering is, 
he will get better if the slipper is taken away. They think it's the shoe's fault. They think he's caught like a contagion from the shoe. It's amazing. I can't was... believe that that's their <laughs> logic. It was so good. It's the shoe that's the problem. The shoe. Um, so they wa- they're going to take it away from him, but nobody wants to be the one to actually try to take it away from him, which implies that someone has tried to take it away from him in the past, and the prince just beat that person to a bloody pulp. So they know it's going to go badly, which is why they've had to wait for him to like fall into an opium-induced dream state. The princess put the shoe on a chair next to the bed Mm -hmm. and a guy goes in and grabs the shoe and then something happens to him and I thought he melted. I thought he melted too. We had to stop the movie and go back and watch it again. We were so confused. But what actually happens is he disappears and reappears inside a glass container that the fairy (laughs) godmother has like a bell jar and he's tiny. And he's screaming. Um, he's screaming. There's a little ladder. She's putting a cheesecloth over the top of the jar so that I guess maggots don't get in with him because that's what those cloths are used for. There's a little ladder and he's just got his face terrifyingly shoved up against the glass. Like all his facial features are just smushed. And he's screaming at the top of his itty bitty lungs. The fairy godmother appears to be taunting him because she keeps poking at him with her index finger. Yeah, just like tapping the glass the way you do to annoy a spider. She's doing that. And he's sort of shaking his fist to her. And there's a whole bunch of other jars nearby. So she is clearly prepared. Um, (laughs) She's ready. She's ready. Fortunately, that never happens again, which is good because I don't think my heart could take it. So, yeah, I just got to read you my notes for a second. Oh, my God. Fairy Godmother Shrunkman is keeping him in a little jar full of cheese? Question mark, question mark like a bug question mark question mark oh my god I'm so scared (laughs) that's just what happened in my I had that scene in all caps (laughs) no fairy godmother has him in a glass case but he's tiny he's screaming she's taunting him with a finger but in all caps yep so next we get the shoe proclamation scene and I'm gonna go ahead and say this this is one of the weirdest shoe montages we've ever seen because no one tries on the shoe no, not a single person. A big entourage of folks show up just like they did with the ball announcement. And we again see a piece of paper that we can't read, but presumably it says that whoever fits this shoe, Prince Mary, something, something, whatever. But no one tries on the shoe uh, no. at all. It just sits on the pillow and the stepsisters don't try it on and no one tries it on. And then everybody goes back to the palace and we are told that the fairy godmother wants to prove the prince's love. And then the fairy godmother takes Cinderella to a fountain. In like and, a cave or something? Yeah, or like a corner of a garden and, and gestures at it. And Cinderella leans close with her ear to this stream of water like she's listening to it. I thought she was going to magically use the fountain to listen into like a fountain where the prince was. Like they bugged the fountain and hear him talk about how much he loves her. But no, she just shoves her head under it. Her entire head, like, her hair gets wet. Oh, she's soaked. This is a lot of water pressure. So, uh, I'm so sorry. My notes go in and out of caps lock so many times. So she's, she's totally soaked her hair. And the fairy godmother gives her a basket of fruit to take to the palace for the prince. We are once again in evil witch poisoned apple mode. This is evil classical music playing here again. And then we cut back to the palace where we are informed that no one has been able to try has the shoe has not fit. What do the words say? Okay. It says that the prince's messenger could not find a lady to wear Cinderella's little slipper. Do you think it's because no one tried the shoe on? Do you <laughs> think that he like didn't get the memo that they were to put the shoe on their feet? Do you think he just came and was like, here's a shoe. Bye. Maybe everyone was like, well, I know I didn't lose a shoe, so I'm not going to try it on. Oh my God. That'd be amazing. Just a kingdom full of very honest people just saying, Oh, no, well, it wasn't me then. Oh, Could I love you imagine? <laughs> I'll have to mess up so many fairy tales. I love it so much. Oh. So then we see, we're back at the palace, and then we see Cinderella just walk in, and she's taking the fruits of the prince, and they just let her, I guess. I have that she's played by a different entire actor now. So I think washing her hair in the fountain was supposed to transform her, because she's now supposed to be a Romany, like a wandering vagrant. And she has dark hair now 
and completely different facial features. So I think this is a different person. Oh, I like couldn't tell that that was a different person, but I could tell that she was wearing a different outfit. She's wearing a different outfit. Her skin is darker and she has dark hair now. It's also wrapped in like a kerchief. She drops something. My notes go, a piece of fabric? Oh no, it's the other shoe. And then she runs away from the palace, just sobbing. So what happens is the prince is just sadly holding the shoe and someone notices her and is like, what is she doing here? And then she runs away. Yeah, dropping a shoe. So she runs to a fountain and is just sobbing. She's still on the premises. She oh, yeah. like has not left the palace garden. No, this is a royal palace fountain. And then she runs to a tree and just starts to pray and sob. And we're told that the miracle of tears, end of sentence. There's no, we're just told thanks to the, like the miracle of tears. Yeah, that's it. We don't know what the miracle is. Nothing oh. happens. Here's what happens. I figured it out now that I've watched the whole stupid movie. Oh, okay. She could not wash the I'm a Romany now disguise off of her. Oh. The fairy godmother's disguise wouldn't wash off in the fountain. She must have been trying to wash off in the fountain. And so she's crying and the miracle of tears on her face makes her a blonde white lady again. Oh my God. That's what happened. So she takes off her headdress, her, her kerchief around her head and she's got again, perfect blonde sausage curls. And she is so excited about this that she's sitting with her legs just straight out in front of her, you know, close together and just sort of wiggling her feet excitedly. And is this the prince or the servant? Because we've been cutting between this and the people being like, she dropped a shoe. Oh my God, it's the same shoe. This shoe, the same shoe, the shoe. I think it's the prince because he was holding one shoe before and now he's holding two shoes. Two shoes? And one in each hand, which okay. just made me laugh for some reason. Oh, so funny. I have, I have servant, but I think looking back on it, this must have been the prince. So the prince has been chasing this girl, stops behind a bush, sees two bare feet sticking out, kicking very fast, like they're doing, like she's doing a flutter kick underwater. Notices that the feet are very tiny. I just, I have to tell you, it's just a row of bushes, like a garden bush <laughs> yeah. thing. And she, her legs are just sticking out. They're just sticking out. Yeah. Uh, and so he sneaks up on her feet and attacks her with a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> and then she flees because from her experience, I was just sitting there minding my own business, sobbing. I'm white again. Thank God I'm Caucasian. And someone just shoves a shoe on my foot. You flee in terror. It was just right. amazing. It was amazing. He didn't go around to see her. Nope. He didn't like say anything. He's, he just he was he, like he, foot shoe done. <laughs> small feet, small foot shoe done. So he she didn't flees. even hold up the shoe to her foot. No, he he doesn't even put it all the way on her. He just like jams the toe part over her toe part. At which point she flees and he chases her. And then the fairy godmother explodes a grain silo. We see it explode, and it explodes. I don't think it was a miniature. I think they blew up a grain silo. I think they blew up a grain as a big mill a grain silo, big building. It explodes, and then the grain silo just sort of transforms into a magic house. I don't understand why the fairy godmother had to blow it up before she could transform it into a house. I feel like they just had a bunch of explosives, and they just wanted to blow something up while they were filming. Do you think they accidentally blew up that farmhouse? Like <laughs> the three prankster guys were like, hey, watch this. I bet I can do something funny. And it blows up. And the person was really mad because they obviously did not give permission for them to blow up their silo. And the movie producers were like, no, 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 no. This is a scene in our movie. Your, your farmhouse is going to be famous. This is a scene in the movie. What scene in the movie involves blowing up a silo? I don't know. <laughs> that is a very unlikely series of events, but I love it. <laughs> So um, a bunch of servants and the prince arrive at this weird house. And Cinderella sort of... reaches the house and she goes inside the house. Okay, yes. The servants kind of run towards the house and then stop and then back up a step and then run towards the house a few more steps and then stop and back up a step and repeat this a couple of times. And, and then Cinderella opens the door. No, something else happens first. Oh, good. What happens next? My, I can't um, even read my notes. So the prince has one shoe in his hand and he 
drops it or something and then it just turns into a crown oh no i found my notes the servants all go in the prince goes to walk in the door but the fairy godmother does magic and slams the door in his face oh and then the fairy godmother drops the shoe the other shoe onto his head like just drops it (laughs) from like the battlements where she's overlooking this like a terrifying crone like saruman drawing the snow to mount caradress like just terrifying so she throws the shoe it hits the ground and then it turns into a crown he picks it up at which point cinderella then opens the door and comes out in her party gown but now it's bedecked in ivy for some reason i thought it was a different dress but i'm not tell. like willing to stake anything on it it looked like the same dress but there were big touches of ivy now which i thought were very distracting so cinderella kneels in front of the prince and he puts the crown on her she flinches and- she flinches okay Okay. she does and they clasp hands and like lean in for a kiss and we get a shot of everyone cheering in the windows and the fairy godmother looking down from the balcony that she's in oh is that what happened because i have that the fairy godmother closed all the the blinds and made them all cover their eyes so they couldn't see them kiss oh maybe i know they cheer first yeah, they cheer, but then they go into kiss, and the fairy godmother makes all of the the window shutters slam shut, and they open again, and everybody's hands are like weirdly around their eyes. I did not I see any of that. Ah, I could have hallucinated that. I, I'm not willing. No, to- I'm sure you're right. I just, I literally must have been looking down at my notes when this happened. If this movie went really fast, and so then the the fairy godmother invisible shawls herself out of this movie. She flings her arms open like really wide and just stands there for a while and then she disappears. There's like a sparkly thin shawl behind her and she eventually lowers her arms and sort of wraps it around herself and disappears, which is a pretty cool transition. Like I like the the cloak into disappearing special effect. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. And so then the prince leads Cinderella back into their used to be an exploded silo. Now it's a mansion house and the movie is done. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're done now. We've, we're finished watching this. Yeah, yeah. That was so many things. So many, so many things, things happened. happened. Oh my god, I wasn't prepared for that many things. I mean, I knew it was going to be a little wild because it was a silent film, but I was thinking, you know, oh hey, it's you know twenty five minutes instead of six. Surely this will go better. <laughs> so what are your um highs highs and lows? Highs and lows, Todd. Okay, my high was how sad the prince was all the time. I <laughs> loved him playing the cello with his head bent down low. And I loved him like leaving the ball to look out of a window all moodily. Yeah. It was great. My low is the Romani scene. I just didn't understand what it was for. And I didn't like it because it was gross. Yeah, it was weird. There was, there was no reason she couldn't have just been like a traveler or a beggar girl. Yeah. The Romani scene was weird. I don't know why that happened. I don't know what that was supposed to prove. Yeah, like, did she just want a look at the prince to see that he's pining after her? I don't know. She didn't seem happy with that. The fairy godmother said that he needed to prove his love. I was thinking that she was going to go to him, you know, even more raggedy than she normally is with the shoe and say, it's me, and see if he accepted her in her poor clothes, like in her extra super poor clothes. Mm -hmm. not just her regular poor clothes and that that would be the proof but then she just runs away also we talked about this a little bit before the record started but that means that she dropped the other pair of a shoe which means either she had two identical pairs of shoes or she walked to the palace wearing one shoe which had to have been what happened because she's barefoot later so she walked to the palace in a single shoe she's just tromping around a palace in one shoe and one barefoot like a monster I just I don't understand the reasoning behind that. If you only have one shoe, then you just don't wear it. You just carry it or you wear a different pair of shoes where you have two of them. <laughs> like, I'm so confused. What kind of maniac? <laughs> I mean, there, there is a slight echo in the, um, in, in the Disney Cinderella, the, the 1950s one, where the shoe breaks and the duke is like oh no the shoe is broken and she goes well maybe this could help i have the other one and mm-hmm. uses it as proof that she's the girl and like that that makes sense that's cool that's why you would produce the other slipper but you wouldn't be wearing it on your foot she did and cinderella gets it on 
yeah, but that was Carol Burnett. And she <laughs> she, she clunked <laughs> with Lin <Shuan. laughs> That was That was pretty great. That was pretty great. I don't want to make a category for walks around with literally only one shoe. I don't <laughs> want that to be a category. So Liv, right. what are your highs and lows? So my highs, I think, uh, I really liked the classical music. I thought the background music for this was wonderful. It was extremely disorienting, but I really enjoyed it. But I think my high is the uh, transition to you're invisible now because you wrapped a cloak around yourself because special effects from the 20s are what they are. But that one's really well done. It's a dark cloak. She wraps it around herself and she's against the dark night. And so she seems to vanish visually to us because black on black is not visible. But then she's also just gone. It was a cool transition. The wind was blowing. It was all leaves and trees and stuff. I liked it. I thought it was really cool. I thought the special effects were like, really well done yeah they were I, I was very impressed we have seen much worse special effects much more recently oh yes oh yes Lowe's I didn't like that the fairy godmother was included in so many things <laughs> I, I I like it when our Cinderella knows her fairy godmother beforehand I find that charming but she doesn't have to go to the party Cinderella doesn't have to be hanging out with her being told her future by a weird magic mirror this was too fairy godmother centric without introducing anything else that mattered. We've established that she's magic and she can poof wherever she wants and appear wherever she wants and do whatever she wants. There's no reason that she has to be included in the storyline for it like to make sense that she's there. She's magic. She could just be there. They used her in places where you could have just not had magic. Or just not had anything. You don't need to talk about who's playing music at the party. We're assuming that there's music at this party. Yeah. They're dancing no one's assuming that they're dancing in silence like you, you didn't need to explain that to us do you know this would only make sense if the fairy godmother was played by some famous german actress and they had to like have a bunch of scenes for her and she happened to play the piano so they had to like write in a scene where, where she, she plays, plays the it. piano that would explain a lot of this movie yeah so what would you change about this movie um the two shoes that was just weird <laughs> and confusing just one shoe is fine you can just have one shoe. How about you? Yeah. I would limit the fairy godmother's powers because if when you find out that she is aware of all the things that are going to happen to Cinderella, and I think by dint of the fact that she tells us that she is weaving the golden threads of her future, that implies that she's planning it. She's weaving it. She's making it that way. Oh, yikes. I didn't right? think of it that way. I mean, it's not like she's just looking at it in the mirror. She's weaving it. She's making it happen, which means that she knows all this is going to happen because she's got it in her little lesson book. It's in her weird golden spider web. So the fact that A, I think she's doing all this to Cinderella, and B, she could stop it all at any time. We've established she could just blow up that grain silo whenever and give her an entire new household. There's no reason for her to be allowing this to happen to Cinderella at all. Definitely. And I. Like, she should have a limit. Like, oh, I can only do, like, cosmetic changes. Oh, I can only do stuff at nighttime. Eh, something. She had too much power for this many bad things to happen to a charge of hers, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it raises a lot of questions. Yeah, very uncomfortable questions. I, don't I can't believe that in a Cinderella in which the father is alive, there are things that we want to change more than that. Yeah, yeah. This was a very bizarre viewing which which leads us to do you think our listeners should watch this oh absolutely yeah it was great 100 percent. this was super fun i still kind of wanted to watch it on a half speed just because things happened really fast yes. although possibly if i wasn't taking notes it would feel a little bit less manic but this was really fun very fun black and white silent film 25 minutes guys super fast it's got a lot of things <laughs> it sure does it, it's got a high stuff happening per minute quotient yes you will not be bored. You, you physically can't be bored. So would you watch this again, Talon? Oh, yeah. I'm definitely going to watch it again because I feel like I missed a bunch of it. Yeah, likewise. My husband would like this. All of my weird friends with their weird movie stuffs would like this. This is fun. Definitely going to watch this again. So given that, what is your final grade for this movie? Oh. Right? I'm also deeply confused. Okay. I think I'm giving this movie a B minus. Okay. Because I really liked it, but I don't think it was a good movie. Like it didn't make a lot of sense. And there were a lot of structural things that just didn't work for me, but I did like it. Yeah, that's, that's very fair. 
How about you? What grade are you giving it? So for similar reasons, I'm giving it an A minus because I had a really great time. This was wild. I never knew what was coming next. <laughs> it was a different story than when we normally got because we got a fairy godmother, but also a dead mom ghost. There were a lot of ghosts. Wasn't expecting ghosts. So I just, yeah. I thought the three ghosts showing up and then oh, also the graveyard and then like, it was just too many things. So weird. I love old movies. So crazy old movies that I can follow along with make me really happy. And I had a really good viewing experience. This was really fun for me. And this had a lot of hallmarks of a Cinderella. A lot of the things that I like were in there. Most of the things that I don't like were not in there. So that was good. Yeah. Plotting weird. Uh, <laughs> extremely. But it was Germany in the 1920s. So I'm going to give them a little bit of slack. So I'm, I'm grading. I'm grading less harshly than I would if this was, you know, a short that was made in the 50s or something. But A minus. I this was fun. I liked it. Well, it's almost midnight, so thanks for joining us. If you liked this episode, please leave us a rating or review. We'd love to hear from you, so follow us at Cinderpod on Twitter and Instagram, like our Facebook page, or email us at the Cinderella Podcast at gmail.com. If you want bibbity bobbity bonus episodes or to hear us discuss this week's Cinderella, but with more adult questions, language, and beverages, join us in the Ever After Party at patreon.com slash cinderpod. Our intro music is Bad Ideas by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at incompetech.com. So Liv, what are we watching next week? I'm so happy you asked, Talon. Next week, we're going to watch a Cinderella story, A Christmas Wish. How this are is, we not done with this yet? There's two more. There's two more. If this is the... Four was too many, so we made two more. We're still making these suffer. I don't know how it's going to go. I don't have any thoughts about this. I'm terrified. I feel like I'm that, that feeling you get when you get hauled to the top of a roller coaster and you realize that you can't get off. That feeling. I feel that feeling for this coming up movie. But I feel a little queasy. <laughs> we, we will finish the Another Cinderella Story franchise this season. And then we will not have to do those again until they make another one. Thank goodness. Which they do every two or three years. So, oh. <laughs> so that's well, what we're doing next week. <laughs> well, until next week, we hope you have a happily ever after.